It's such a joy to be back to World Assembly, to this amazing, amazing meeting. It's, it's truly a gift that I speak on an evening when Myanmar and Cambodia are being received as member movements. It's a gift. There's something we share, tyranny. All the 65 years I have lived on this earth, of the five decades, I have lived with tyranny, and I still do. I was actually thinking maybe we need those of us who live in these tyrannical regimes, let's have a conference of our own. <laughs> let's talk together. Because I think there are some things we go through that the rest of you don't understand. And uh, please pick that up, please IFES. So I'm really delighted that you have a peek in a story that is mine. I could tell you more, but I won't. It's my location in Kampala, in Uganda, but my story is only a very, very tiny, tiny piece of what so many Africans, Asians, Latinos, the undocumented, the unnamed, the unknown, that suffer. And so today, brothers and sisters, we are going to be speaking about these critical issues. And as we do, I want to first of all uh, truly say how grateful I am for the gift of being here. I praise the Lord very, very much for this story of IFES, a transforming story in my life. I say without any shadow of contradiction, any fear of that I do not have a sense of anything I could be without IFES. IFES is my story. I could say more. But you know, my brother Daniel Bodanet yesterday spoke about some heroes, heroes of the account of IFES. And Daniel, where are you? I have good news for you. It's not only John Stott, it's not only Billy Graham, it's not only John Piper. In fact, I don't even know John Piper. Hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Let's talk some more people. It is IFES that introduced me to Adalam. Hallelujah. For the women in IFES. So let me keep going, please. May I add Ruth Padir? May I add? May I add Meruba Magay? May I add? No, let's go to men. Rene Padilla, Samuel Escobar. And let me tell you, and IFES people, watch this space. There are those that are part of this family, but we don't think they're part of this family. And I think Gustav Gutierrez is one of those. He changed my thinking, sharpened my understanding. The North Ramachandra, my brother and friend. Bear Magalit. Okay, so the others that are not named in our history, but are shaping the story. My mentor, Andrew Walls, my brother and departed friend, Kwame Bediako. I won't stop, I will go on. Maybe we need a time when we simply talk about the people. Maybe our story and the way we tell it will change. Tibi Dankwa, and more recently, praise the Lord, my dear brother, Chris Wright. And the list goes on. Amen. The list goes on. Today, 
that list has been enriched by brothers and sisters from this part of the world. So I come to a family, a delightful family. But like all families, we have our own dysfunctionalities. There are things that don't work in IFES. <laughs> you know, in IFES, we simply do not know how to deal with the difference. It troubles us. We just, especially when people say things that are unrattling, that are destabilizing status quo, we put them to order. I am one of those who was put to order. <laughs> and so, I was exited. I was shown the exit about 20 years ago. So I want to say thank you to Daniel Bodane, my brother and friend, Martin Heitzman, my dear brother and friend, and several others who <laughs> called me back 20 years after. Thank you very much. So this is a good moment, and please receive it with me because Seriously, it's an opportunity for me to make peace with my history, and I'm delighted. I may not have the time to speak to some of you with whom we shared the pain or with whom we caused the pain to one another, but I hope, brothers and sisters, I am here as one who says we are a broken people, we have a broken institution, we are like all families broken. But let me tell you the good news. God is at work. Hallelujah. Amen. And so it's a gift for me to be back. But I have the joyful challenge opportunity to name some of the things that do not work. What you have seen is a perspective from which I speak. But let me invite my friends who I asked. There's something I want us to learn. There are four key words that are going to be important in this conversation. Can I have the five, please? Run quickly. Five of you. Where is Moteke? Where is the five people? Please come. We need to do this quickly. So the four words you want to remember are perspective, story, power, Witness, perspective, story, power, and witness. So, I would like you to stand here. Motseki from South Africa, wonderful. Please, and uh, I plead with you to stay according to my instructions. And who is courageous to look at his, please remove this jacket, I want to see other things. <laughs> I'm very clear, you know. This man is hiding things, we want to see. Anybody putting on anything heavy, please, please. Okay, so uh, please come. This is a, a younger man. I think he will, he will not be threatening to you. Uh, you're going to stand right here. And then uh, you are going to stand. Let's have the courageous younger people look at this, the, the real serious issues. Please come here, right here, uh, directly, you know, facing him, facing him, facing him. And then yourself, if you come right here, do we have a microphone? Yes, you're going to start. So, no, no, you're going to start. I am the chief here. Hello, hello. Who are you? Larry from Romania. 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 <laughs> okay, Romania. Tall. Are Romanians white also? Yes. <laughs> Most of. Most of them. So you're actually white. <laughs> I'm a bit tanned now. You're, yes. be, you're actually white. You're a white man. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Please clap for a white man. Right, right, right. So we have a white man. How old are you? 27. 27. 27. So what I want you to tell this audience is what do you see? I want you to look at Motseke, his body, and tell us. <laughs> look at his body and tell us what you're seeing. Please quickly, no, no. Look, please, go ahead, very quickly. 
I see a man dressed in um, a shirt. Uh, he has a... Don't look round, look straight. Look. <laughs> so... Instructions are difficult. Look straight. I see a man who has ears. I don't know how you know he's a man, but go ahead. And he has a goatee. Um, he has slightly some hair. Okay. Okay, please, one more chance. One more chance. What do you see? What else? What else is visible? A man that looks like me and has a belly. Okay, okay, okay. Did you talk about an arm? About? The arm. Did you see an arm? Yes, I Why saw Why didn't you talk about it? Okay, let's change here. Right, right, right. Let's try this side. Tell us what you see. Um, I see a man with uh, trying to smile or not to smile, <laughs> and he has a beard. No, 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 no. Please focus on the body. Please. Okay, he has a beard and mustache and an arm, and he has a ring in his finger, on his finger, and... He has a ring. Yes. All right, keep going. And he has leather shoes and... Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Let's go here. So you hear Motseke has one arm. There is consensus he has one arm from both sides. Um, I see a man who has two arms. What? 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 What's this issue about a man? What's the Because evidence? I see it. I, I'm looking at it. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> okay, uh, keep going. Keep yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has uh, two eyes, one nose, one mouth. Uh, yes, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't see it. Thank you very much. And what do you see? Yes, you're a young woman. You're 20 years. Be bold. 20 years. Um, I don't know if he's a man or not, but there's a person. Um, there's a head with some wrinkles and two arms, or the back of two arms, um, and legs, two legs, and a rip in the jeans, and two ears, or back of ears, and all some hair. Alright, alright. Uh, uh, clearly, what are you afraid of seeing about the bum? He has a bum! How can you be a person without a bum? My God. What's wrong with you? You are young. Talk about things as they are. He has a bum. He has there. a bum. Wow, wonderful. Okay, give them a clap. Please, 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 please. Thank you very much. So, please, a round of applause for Moseki, please. Uh, wonderful. Now, right, the guy has a bum. But Sun refused to tell us about the stomach, you know? <laughs> These are essential things that men are not happy when you mention publicly. So, uh, is Motseke's wife here? Please forgive me. Perspective. 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 The view from where you stand. A viewpoint. That's a challenge. That's a challenge, perspective. The second word I will speak about is story. Each one had a story. Some distorted, distorted by certain information they had before. Did you notice all of them said a man? Difficult to adduce the evidence, but it's the story they have. Each one of us sees what we have seen. The story we tell is a story we have heard, is a story we have believed, is the story we also tell the world. That story matters. That story is shaped by our history, that story is shaped by our location. Story. 
With each story, there is power. So each could only speak with confidence of the location. Location comes with power. And we'll speak briefly again about witness. Witness. Just so that you have a sense of where we are going, let me try and summarize. Here it is. That we see what we can only see. Perspective. Sometimes we have the deception that we see the whole. None sees the whole. And evangelicals, listen to me. There is evangelical truth, but there is not one who has evangelical truth. We all have a perspective to that truth. Perspective, the location, and what we see is shaped by our location. The challenge is that we sometimes do not even see Clearly, from where we stand, we miss the details because of the distortions of our history. We are going to speak about our history. Why? Because our history shapes what we see. History shapes even how we experience today. Remember the story of Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, do you remember? They couldn't see Jesus. Our stories therefore shape what we see. And wherever we are located, that location is informed by, and I credit my dear brother Chris Wright for naming it this way, the grand story in his book, God's Mission. The grand story. Sometimes we think we live by a certain story. The evidence of the story you live by is the performance, is the way you live. For the story you tell is not necessarily the story you live. The verbalization may have dissonance with the actual living. The critical issue is how you live the performance in life, the grand story. But here is another challenge. We, you and I, believe that the gospel is God's good news to the world. That is our distinctive. But I wonder whether we believe the same story. Perspective matters. I'm going to be suggesting that the particular perspective that has shaped the history of IFES is the story of empire, colonialism, and colonization. I'm going to suggest that our experience in this room comes from both ends of coloniality. On the one hand, there are those of us whose lives and benefits are invested in the project of conquest and oppression of other people. Where we are right now, this venue is part of the story of oppression. This space we are enjoying is part of the story of apartheid in this country. Friends, let's not just enjoy the beds, the space, the creativity. Remember this place is part of the pain of South Africa. Let me tell you what else is sad about this place. I won't name which of the two locations. But in one of the two locations where we are, they pay their staff below the required minimum wage of this country. So here we are, celebrating, praising, rejoicing, sitting on a piece of property which needs 
to be redeemed. So I want us to be very clear that the colonial experience is not distant from any of us. You either are one of those who continue to benefit from colonialism. In fact, let me say it properly and more clearly. IFES idea is built on conquest. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. Wait a moment. And please give me a mini hearing. The idea of the university described to us yesterday, created in the Middle Ages, the university as a Western idea, is part of institutions of privilege. Institutions of creating a way in which we inhabit the world of work that segregates. Universities are sites of segregation. And so when we, IFES, name the university as the strategy for changing the world, in which form are we changing the world when we use the very institution that is part of oppression? Let me explain this. A statistic was given to me yesterday. Here in South Africa, just to share with you the disparity, the unemployment rate among young people who have only finished high school, the unemployment rate is 35%. The unemployment rate among those who have finished higher education, university, guess what it is? It's 2%. In other words, university is a privilege of very few. It is a privilege. I'll come back to that hopefully when I have time. But let me keep giving you what, this, what I'm seeking to say. Colonialism coloniality, and I thank the Latinos for helping us to think through what this really means. And please read more uh, in this. Education, therefore, Western education in particular, is part of the performance of empire. Bear with me. The dichotomization of evangelism and social concern is a direct fruit of empire, dualism, that we have drunk, drunk to the dregs. The wars we have fought, evangelism and social concern, and please my brothers, Europeans and North Americans, please listen, your salvation from dualism does not lie in America or Europe. Come to Uganda, we will teach you. <laughs> Go to Myanmar. Go to Cambodia. I may not say this to InterVarsity Christian Fellowship America. Maybe it is time to stop naming those mission trips, mission trips. Simply call them learning trips. Here is what else I hope to say. The grand story as told in the scriptures, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the story as lived, manifested in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. And Paul does a translation which is amazing, amazing, amazing. The Bible is amazing. Paul does a translation. Have you noticed in the epistles there is very literal kingdom of God? It's there, but it's, the language is not used. I am coming back to the issue of language. Language matters, brothers and sisters. The issue of language. So he talks about the lordship of Christ. So the message of the kingdom of God is the message of the lordship of Christ. Amen? Amen. Up to that point, I hope we are together. But here is the challenge. The mandate, the obligation, the responsibility that that grand story, and I won't use the word global, because globalization is part of the story of conquest and colonization. I'll come to that when we have time, not now. We will talk about the grand story, 
the story of Jesus, the kingdom, the lordship of Christ, but that too. So the critical question that IFES is faced up with is what is the gospel? Let's have conversations about the gospel. Why? Because there are many distortions in our family. Part of the evidence is the performance. Performance of gospel work in the world, we name it as mission, right? Mission, missionary. Now, I join the team of those who have wondered about this naming. I think it's David Bosch who first questioned. And so he used a term that I loved when I read that book, Transforming Mission, because I was so troubled by mission and colonization, and I really wanted, can't this thing be saved? So I read David Bosch, Transforming Mission, and I was excited. And then I read variants of this. There was that which speaks about miss your day, miss your day. And you know you can't say it well unless you use Monsieur Day. Do you understand? I pity those of you who can't say Monsieur, please. <laughs> That's just a joke. I hoped you would laugh. You're getting too serious, guys. Right. Monsieur Day. And then the Latinos say, no, no, no. Monsieur Integral, right? Did I get that right? Mission, <laughs> integral mission. And, and so there is a question. The idea was this thing, this thing, right? Let's try and redeem it. And uh, some of you, I encourage you to read the book, Transcending Mission, by Michael Stroop. It's an amazing book. He joins the struggle. And uh, I have, I hope, already spoken to you about uh, my dear brother, uh, Chris Wright, and other books along this paradigm of mission. Transcending Mission simply suggests that this is a total distortion. I want actually personally to go ahead and go a bit farther. And here is where the risk is. I am proposing that it is time to repent mission. Let me be clear why. It is invested in a way of inhabiting the world that is not consistent with the gospel. What a strong statement to make. Now, for those of us who come from lands where, let's have a conversation. Please tell your neighbor what the word mission is in your mother tongue. Mission in your mother tongue. Especially if Spanish is not your mother tongue, English is not your mother tongue, these European languages are not your mother tongue. That's your opportunity. Okay. So... <laughs> I have tried. I have tried. Can we call back to order? I have tried. Can I tell you what I have found out? And if you have something the contrary, let's have the conversation. The word, actually, whether east, west, or south, certainly among African languages, I have not found a people who have the equivalent of the word mission. I haven't found. Now, that seems to say something. For if something is essential to the world, the way we inhabit the world as people informed by the gospel grand story, surely it must be present in every culture, Buddhist, African, Muslim. It should be present. Why? Because we believe the gospel is translatable. Right, I am sure you are asking, what is the biblical basis? Let me try. So the passage is Luke. And let me encourage you. The evangelists, it's amazing in God's providence, we have four perspectives. Don't we? We have how many? Four perspectives. For some reason, we like Matthew chapter 28. For some reason, the only way we read the rest of the commission narratives is we read from the lens given to us by Matthew. I am proposing to us, let's shift. 
Suppose we read the commission narratives from the perspective of Luke. What will it do to us? First of all, we discover that Luke begins that story in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. You know it. I don't need for us to read it. But you know what it says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to the prisoners, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Wow. The poor, the prisoners, the blind, and the oppressed. Luke is very consistent in understanding this way of speaking the message of the kingdom. Luke chapter 7, the version of the Beatitudes. Blessed are you, Luke chapter 7 verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you. Blessed are you when people exclude you. Blessed are you when you are rejected. My goodness. What does he say? The poor, the hungry, those who weep and mourn, those, my anima, who weep on stage, blessed are you. When you are hated, blessed are you who are excluded. Here is the point that it seems to me Luke makes. As the rest of the Gospels, and it is this, that the evidence of the work of the kingdom is visible on the margins with the dispossessed, with the oppressed, rather than with the center. Let me say that again. The Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 also name it the same way. It's Richard Raw, and if you have time, please read his commentary. It's excellent. Where he speaks about how Jesus takes the dregs of society to speak about what kingdom is about. And he says, the blessed, those who will experience the kingdom, are such as, not only such as, which is why I like Luke, Luke says, not such as, Luke says, blessed are you who are poor. Matthew says, blessed are the poor. Luke says, no, blessed are you the poor. It's about power. Nathaniel, I like Nathaniel, I like Nathaniel, because Nathaniel is like me. Nathaniel in the Gospel of John chapter 1, um, Philip comes to him, John chapter 1, you know that story, Philip, like Andrew Peter, was from the town of Bethesda, so Philip found Nathaniel, the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 45, and the, Philip says, excited to Nathaniel, we have found, hello, the one Moses wrote about in the law. We have seen the one who the prophets spoke about. We have seen him. My, what a statement. Nathaniel is saying the Messiah is here, guys. But CNN didn't report it. <laughs> BBC was ignorant. Can I keep going? And that's the point that Nathaniel makes. How can you say it is so important and BBC missed it? How can you say it's so crucial and Fox News missed it? How can it be and John Stott didn't write about it? And John Piper didn't get it. And who else? Hello? And Intervarsity didn't get it. Hello? Shall we keep going? Oxford didn't catch it. 
Cambridge missed it. Stanford was off track. Because Nathaniel says, Nathaniel says, hello, can anything good come from there? Hello, <laughs> you are a joker. Nothing, <laughs> can anything good come from Nazareth? And Jesus sees Nathaniel. I know Philip is amazing. Philip says, hello, hello, don't judge. Just come and see. Hello, come and, come where? Come to the margins. Relocate from the centers of false power. Come to the margins. Philip says, surprise, 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 Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Hey, Nathaniel, not only can something good come, Nathaniel, all the good, all the good is coming from Nazareth. I saw witness on the campus. So we think the strategic location of the university is because it is a seat of power. You got it wrong. We need to think differently about the campus. And it seems to me the genius is in a story that a young woman that I met here told me. She is from Stanford University. When yesterday Stanford was called, she was embarrassed. Because she said to me, I wish you knew Stanford University. That it's built on exploitation. That Stanford University not only exploited laborers then, people of color, Stanford University to this day exploits laborers. So, if Stanford University, if the Christian Union group is going to be bear witness of the message of the kingdom of God at Stanford University, it's not to connect with Facebook. It's not to connect. Who are your other neighbors, my friend? No, it's to connect with the people who are cleaners, who are sweeping. Those are the people. For I say this to you. If, if, if Isaiah, which is where Luke takes the passage, if Isaiah was to write today, if Luke was to quote Isaiah today, what would he say? He would say, he has been revealed to preach good news to the immigrants. To preach good news to the undocumented, the unnamed. He has come to preach good news to the unemployed. In Uganda, the unemployment rate is 85% among the youth. He has come, and that's why Cambodia's story, Myanmar's story is powerful. Brothers and sisters, whoever said any country is closed to the gospel? The issue is closed to who? And it's just as well, many countries are closed to Americans and Europeans. Praise the Lord. But who said that it is only the Americans, it's only the Europeans, it's only the people who have transferable currency? May I speak to South Africans? Because you have the Rwand, you think you're going to be the chiefs of Africa, please keep your money. It seems to me, therefore, a gospel witness that is global, locally, locally, deals with the local, identifies with the margins. And let me try and work to finish. This is the message. Jesus is suggesting that the people who get it, 
The people who get it, who get the message of the Lordship of Christ, of the kingdom of God, are not the people who wield power, who have the deception of power, not the conquerors, not the colonizers. No, they have a false sense of power. That if you really want to understand how the gospel works, go to the margins. Can I be clear again? You don't go to the margins as missionaries. No, you go to the margins to learn the gospel story. You go to the dispossessed, to the disinherited, to learn the gospel. Now, just in case those of us who come from the story of disinheritance, dispossession, and you know how it is. This is how we relate to one another. The, those with the colonizer um, narrative, you know, those of you who have dollars and pounds, and you know what I'm talking about, uh, world trade, IMF, and all the things we have suffered. And you kind of feel, you know, without our dollars and so on. And then when your dollars are beginning to be less meaningful and the guns are all and so on, then you are, the problem with the West is it is driven by fear. And that's why I like Trump. I like Trump because Trump reflects the story. Fear. Fear. The fear of the other. The fear of the other. And there is a form of Christianity, Lord have mercy, that is socialized into fear. The Bible says there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. That's the story. So let me speak to you. These groups that are racialized, and, and I understand it's tough, but you have Asian student ministry, black student ministry, white student ministry. Hello, hello, hello. I told my IFS friends when we were here, uh, recognizing two student movements, 1987, I was there. It was a sad day. When we registered, we accepted affiliation of a black student movement from South Africa and a white student movement from South Africa. What a terrible witness of the gospel. That's the challenge of the gospel. Talking about Trump. So, <laughs> we have to name them, okay? <laughs> For me, you know, gospel work is not public relations. <laughs> it's serious work, you know? So, because I have a, I have a, a dictator in Uganda, you've heard, he's, he's trying to kill me. And the, the plan is still on to kill me, and that's okay. I, you know, I actually say, when public, I said, if anybody announces we are going to kill Zach, I said, to them, you've done me a favor. Very few of us know what is going to kill them. So if you tell me you're going to kill me, thank you very much. I am more prepared. You know? So you don't say, I'm going to kill you. No, please. Try something else. <laughs> but he's trying. <laughs> Can I tell you this? You've heard about Myanmar. You've heard about Cambodia. Can I tell you what keeps Museveni in power? It's Pentagon. So can I say this to IVCVF? You really want to participate in gospel witness in Uganda. Look, the unemployment rate. Look, the doctors. Look, do you know the reason? We have a dictator. We have a thief in charge of political power. I say these things in Uganda. I'm not saying them because I'm here. We have thugs in charge of political power. Ask the people from Cambodia. I won't say ask the Americans yet, but you know. <laughs> I'll talk about Uganda. South Africans, you know our friend Zuma, right? Don't you? And the thing about it, by the way, these people are our relatives. It's not that we hate them. They are what? Our relatives. So. <laughs> so can I tell you what you could do for us in a vast Christian fellowship and you know I say things in extreme ways so bear with me rather than sending mission trips to Uganda send a mission trip to Pentagon and camp there and say we will not relent until Senate 
House of Representatives passes a bill to stop. Should I talk about Iran now? I should. I should. IVCF, National Student Movement, go to Pentagon and say, we have brothers and sisters in Iran, in Cambodia. Please, for goodness sake, let us talk. This force deceptive power of violence, brothers and sisters, we come to the cross. where the ground is leveled. So let me conclude by challenging the paradigm of mission. I am suggesting that the gospel mandate to us, that what the gospel requires of us, you remember what Micah said, what does he require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. So Luke tells us the disciples are really concerned whether Jesus is going to restore the power of Israel according to the like of David. Are you going to restore the kingdom? Please tell us. <laughs> you know? Are you going to conquer these Romans and finish them? And Jesus realizes they don't get it yet. And he says to them, you will receive power. Hallelujah. IFES, let's talk more about the Holy Spirit. Let's talk more about listening to the Holy Spirit. And then Luke says, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Not missionaries, I dare say. Now, those of us who are missionaries, don't get me wrong. Hallelujah. God has used you even when you misnamed what it is you are doing. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. You know, God doesn't wait for me to get it right, to use me. Look, I am here. I am here. I am a broken guy. I am a sinful guy. You want to know? Ask Theodora. But God still uses me. So if you called yourself a missionary and God used you, hallelujah, hallelujah. But please, you can't stay with the wrong name. Suppose we try to find a name that works. Africans, don't try to be missionaries. You won't succeed. Just bear the gospel witness. Here is the challenge. We are to live the universal story, the kingdom of God, the lordship of Christ on our campuses. How? Here is where the university will have meaning if it only connects with the margins. Let's speak about higher learning. Who told you that scholarship belongs to the Middle Ages where the university began? Who told you that higher learning is a preserve of Europe? Please, let's tell the story. The Egyptians, the Africans. I learned the idea of story, not from a book in a library, but from a fireplace sitting by my father. And my father told me, son, life is a story. Unfortunately, I didn't believe him. Now I do. I thank God. May God give us grace to live the story, to bear witness. Yes, whatever. But please remember, we come to it from the vantage point where we are. God give us grace. Amen.